Dr. Dave DeSanti is the founder of the Institute for Bird Population in Point Reyes, California. After the radioactive cloud from Chernobyl passed over the U.S. West Coast in the spring of 1986, his research uncovered a severe die-off of young birds. Later, researchers Gould and Goldman duplicated his results with human mortality data in both the U.S. and Germany. The young, the old, and those with weak immune systems were the main casualties, an estimated over 40,000 in all. In mid-March of 2011, as the nuclear disaster in Japan deepens by the day, scientific predictions of fallout again crossing the Pacific are being made. We asked Dr. DeSanti to explain his findings and their implications for today. He started his story in 1986. Well, at that time I was working at the Point Reyes Bird Observatory and um, was in charge of running the Palomarin Field Station, which is located just outside of Bolinas, California, on the coast. And one of the projects that we had going there was um, a project of mist netting birds. And mist nets are these large nets that birds fly into, and we take them out of them and band them and release them. They, they are unhurt. But by looking at the proportion of young in the catch, we can get a measure of productivity. And by looking at mark recapture, that is, you put a band on it, and if you recapture it, we can estimate survival. And that was the program that I had going there. And um, in specifically, we were looking at productivity as a function of the um, amount of winter rainfall we get. California. Coastal California is a Mediterranean climate and virtually all of our rainfall occurs in the winter months between late October and early April, mid-April. And, um, and so we thought that um, there would be a relationship between how much rainfall there was and how many young birds would be produced. And we did find such a, rain, uh, such a relationship with 10 years of data. <clears throat> we found that maximum productivity, the most young were produced at average rainfall conditions. And as we got excessive amounts of rain, as in the El Nino, or low amounts of rain, as in some La Ninas, the productivity decreases. And that seems to be an evolutionarily stable relationship. And we had 10 years of data from 1976 through 1985, and we're in the process of getting it ready for publication. And 1986 came, and we started not catching young birds. Now, not in the very beginning of the season, which we began in around May 10th, but um, in June, about the 10th of June, the numbers of birds that we caught started dropping dramatically. Now, the birds that you catch in mist nets, the young birds, are independent of their parents, which means that they've been fledged for about three weeks uh, to a month, they're out running around on their own, and that's when we began catching these birds. So as, as the number of young birds decreased in, in June, it indicated that something happened in early to mid-May that may have affected their, their productivity. But it was astounding the, how, how few birds there were. I also had a project going in the Sierra, and so I'd spend a week in the Sierra and then come back to Palomar in and where interns were running the nets and and said, you know, well, how does it go today? How many birds you get? 30, 40? And they said, oh, three. Three? Um, wh what, are the nets got holes in them or something? What's going on? And uh, and so I went and walked with them on the net, net lanes and in fact there were no young birds around even to be seen. Usually you can squeak, you can psh, 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 and the young birds, which are curious, they come and to try to see what's happening, and there just was nothing there. And I thought, wow, that's really strange, but um, I'm sure things will pick up a little bit later, and it just got worse and worse. And so w in July, we began wondering what's going on, because this isn't anything like other years. And the first thing we did was to look at the weather data that we had and look at the relationship we already established to predict how many young should we have that year. And we should have had about 10% above normal because rainfall was just a little bit above normal and in the range where you get lots of young. 
And um, somebody suggested, oh, well, it must have been Chernobyl. And we all laughed about it and said, yeah, right, of course, you know, let's, let, let's really figure out what's going on and let's start looking at which birds are being affected the most and whatever we can. And by the time August came around, we had noticed a couple of things. First of all, that um, the numbers of birds began increasing, the numbers of young began increasing at the very end of the season, indicating that there was a period of a month and a half or so um, in which productivity was really poor. I guess it was almost two months that productivity was really, really down. And then, um, uh, and, and then we started making inquiries about what else happened and I talked to various people that I knew and found that productivity in Southern California seemed to be fine. Birds were producing well. Northern California had problems. They had very few young produced up in Arcata area. And a person, Don Dalstein, a professor at UC Berkeley who worked in the entomology department and studied chickadees as to determine their effects on, on eruptive insects like leaf miners and, and insects in the Sierra had a nest box study of chickadees on both the west side and the east side of the Sierra. And he had virtually all the chickadees die in the nests on the, on the west side in their nest boxes. Things were fine on the east side. He, being an entomologist, is monitoring the food supply and found that food supply was fine on both sides of the Sierra. And they thought, they were freaked out. They thought they were carrying some disease around when they checked the young in the various boxes or whatever. And I said, you know, we, we have this really serious reproductive failure here on the coast, too. Well, somebody said, said you know, maybe we ought to look a little more at this Chernobyl possibility. And so we began, began looking at it. And, uh, you know, you can never really identify exactly the cause of these things, but um, the hypothesis that we came up with and that it, it is published is that um, radioactive iodine from Chernobyl that fell out over California when the Chernobyl cloud passed over and coincident with rain on May 6th, rain that fell only in Northern California and to the west side of the Sierra, but not on the east side of the Sierra, that that brought down radioactive iodine, which then coats the, all the vegetation, coats the grasses, coats the everything, leaves. And in particular, those species of birds that feed their young, caterpillars, larvae, things that eat the new growth or eat vegetation, were the ones that were really, really affected. Two of our commonest species in the Bolinas area, warbling vireo, black-headed grosbeak, both of which feed their young, big, juicy caterpillars, produce no young that we could be, that we, certainly we didn't catch any young at Palomarin, and we had no indication there were any young produced at all of those species in these affected areas. Um, Swallows that feed on flying insects that are that emerge from the water seem to be okay. Woodpeckers that feed on um, insects that are in the bark or inside the tree, that both of which feed on detritus-based food webs rather than land-based prim primary productivity food webs, seem to be fine. The distribution of the failure from the little data we had outside of Palmarin was coincident where rainfall was coincident with the passage of the Chernobyl cloud. Everything indicated indicated Chernobyl. Um, it, 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 there has never been another hypothesis suggested to explain it that can't be ruled out, whether it's weather, food supply, numbers of adults to produce the young, conditions on the winter range, all these things that we know now affect affect birds couldn't be ruled out. The, the difficulty of, the, of it is that we got one event well studied at one place. And so what I did as a result of that was um, I established the Institute of, for Bird Populations and the MAPS program, which you can see here on, the, on here, our newsletter that just came out, our newsletter this year. And it's a program of the same kind of misnetting that we did at Palomarin, in which we try to look at vital rates, productivity, and survival. But instead of having one station, now we've had as many as 500 stations in a year 
Altogether, there have been over a thousand map stations established across the United States and southern Canada. And so I've always said the next time something like this happens, we're ready to see if, if there's going to be any effect on the birds. So certainly not that I'm pleased or anything about what might be coming our way, but um, it was a, the, the reproductive failure during that time caused a, a 63, 64% decrease in the number of young birds of all species. And as I say, in those species that had young in the nest right at the time the Chernobyl cloud came over and that iodine fell out, um, apparently 100% reproductive failure. Those, um, and the way we think it works is that a baby bird, when it hatches, looks like a solidified egg yolk or something. I mean, it hardly looks like a bird. It's a little naked creature, eyes closed. You can't even really tell it's a bird. Um, nine days later, that little creature can be flying out of the nest, fully feathered and certainly not grown. It's going to be three weeks dependent upon its parents to feed it until it learns the ways of the world and is on its own then. But still, the rate of development from that hatching to nine or ten days later, eleven days for a robin or something, um, a bigger bird, is, is really astounding. And, and the reason that development is so fast, or, or what facilitates it, of course, is the thyroid. And of course, the thyroid is where iodine goes to. It, it just picks up iodine. And that's what these, these birds got. And, and they got it concentrated in those caterpillars that then grazed on the vegetation. Well, the thing about it is there's also something else that grazes on vegetation that we know about, and those are cows. And so the same thing happens with cows. They pick up this vegetation, this iodine, and they not only concentrate it in their body, but it gets concentrated again when they produce milk. And so people have used the radioactive iodine in milk as a measure of how much radiation had fallen. And the government has tests this milk. I mean, it has done it in the past and, and, and does it all along. And radioactive iodine is one thing that it gets tested for. And so we know pretty good the amount of radioactive iodine that fell from Chernobyl in various places in the country, various areas, southeast, north central, Pacific coast, that kind of stuff, from these testing stations. I don't know exactly how many they have, but I was able to use that data and did a subsequent analysis that actually I didn't publish because I uh, presented it at a major meeting in 1990, but was at that time involved in creating the Institute for Bird Populations here. But I looked at what's called breeding bird survey data, and I looked at the, which breeding bird survey is a network of about 3,000 routes along secondary roads that are 25 miles long and there's a stop every half mile on the half mile. You spend three minutes at each stop and count all the birds you hear and see. Mostly you're hearing these birds and it's been done since the 19, late 1960s. <clears throat> I looked at breeding bird surveys and looked at the number of adult birds that were counted the difference between 1985 and 1986 against the difference between 1986 and 1987. If there was a reproductive failure in 1986, that is few birds produced, the population of adult birds in 1987 would be smaller. And so that difference between 1986 and 1987, I compared to the difference between the previous years, and I compared those in these various regions of the country and found that the biggest decline between two years that could have resulted from Chernobyl was nicely linearly correlated with the amount of radioactive iodine in milk. Might even have had a logarithmic curve, but it was, it was hard to tell. But definitely in those areas where there was more radioactive iodine, there, the population decreased in 1987 more than it did in other areas. The same kinds of studies were done by these folks, Jay Gould and, and Benjamin Goldman, after Chernobyl, using vital rates data on humans rather than on birds. 
And what they found was, and, and they used the same kind of an idea, they looked at how many excess deaths were there in one year compared to the previous year or compared to a 10 years before. Um, and and uh, what was the percentage increase in the number of deaths or the percentage decrease in the number of deaths? And that difference is called excess deaths. It can be negative, which means mortality was less, or it can be positive, which means mortality was greater. And they found a tremendous number of excess deaths in humans in the United States in the four months past following Chernobyl, especially in May of, of 1986. And the total numbers of this is astounding. The total number of excess deaths in the United States during that period was as high as 40,000. Now, is all that due to Chernobyl, or is any of it that due to Chernobyl? That's a hard question, but again, this is a, an anomaly that is coincident with Chernobyl. It's coincident with the bird stuff we found and, and really needs to be considered. Those excess deaths primarily occurred in three groups of people. Infants, infant mortality, that is the first couple of weeks of life, infant mortality had a huge spike, and by a huge spike it was like a 6% increase over any other year. And that's thousands of deaths. The very old, people over 65, there was a spike in, in, in deaths during May and then in June, July, and August of 1986, and people whose immune deficiency was compromised, immune systems were compromised, you would expect due to AIDS, due to pneumonia, due to other factors like that. So the very young and the very old have not fully developed or degraded immune systems. Anyone that had immune system problems were affected by this radiation to a, to a really large extent. And they were able to look at the amount of radioactive iodine across the country and found again a relationship that the greater the amount of radioactive iodine, the greater number of excess deaths, either the greater amount of infant mortality or the greater number of excess deaths from of all people. And they also showed that it was not a linear increase but was a logarithmic increase, that is greater as you go from very low, low levels of radiation up to a little bit higher, and then as you get up to high levels of radiation, although the effect is larger, the change is very small. So it's a curve that, that goes like that. And the problem is that people say there's no effect of low level radiation. Well, if you, if you go to the effect that you know at high levels of radiation, and run a straight line extrapolation down to zero, you say, oh, at very low levels, you're going to get very little. But if the curve actually looks like that, which is what it apparently looks like, and it's corroborated with dosed response curves, as they call them, from Germany, where the levels of radiation were a thousand times greater than in the United States. And the, yes, the total number of deaths was greater, but certainly weren't a thousand times greater. Were an order of maybe five or ten times greater in these different categories. So it really looks like, in fact, that, um, that Chernobyl was responsible for a huge, per, huge peak of mortality during the summer of 1986, not only in birds, but also in humans and presumably many other kinds of most other kinds of, we don't know, vertebrates, warm-blooded creatures, all animals, who knows. But um, we're now potentially facing something like this again. And, and the important thing about it is that it's not, um, it, it, low-level radiation is a serious problem. And particularly, it seems to be, when it's ingested. Because when you ingest these radioactive particles, they're continuing to bombard your immune system and so on as long as they're, they're in you. And if it's cesium or strontium or something like that, we have half-lives of thousands of years and you know, you're contaminated for life. If it's iodine, it has a half-life of only eight days. And that's the reason why 
we found an increase in productivity late in the season because that half-life is so small that that let's say the the um, iodine was was increased 10 times above background level or let's say 20 times above background levels well after eight days it's only 10 times above after 16 days it's only five times above after after another eight days 24 days it's only two and a half times above after 30 days it's only you know not even twice background levels and it decays very rapidly and so that's why there was such a pulse in you know, of this mortality that lasted a relatively short time both in in humans and in birds although it went longer in humans and they also had information indicating that not only was the effect of excess mortality great in those four months right after Chernobyl but nine months after Chernobyl there was another peak in infant mortality suggesting that the fetuses that were being conceived and were very young at the time of Chernobyl were hurt so that nine months later there was another increase in, in infant mortality. Um, and that wasn't due to iodine or it could have been due to iodine right at the time and affected the the fetus then so that it affected mortality later or there could have been other substances, cesium, strontium, whatever. Low level radiation is a problem. That, that, that's, the, that's the bottom line. And it, and it works in affecting the immune response and it works through free radicals. And, and so everyone that's talking about cancer 30 years from now or 20 years from now, sure, those things are, are very possible. But there are also effects of, caused by damage to immune systems that occur immediately or, or after the response or after the, the dose. Um, so I guess, I guess that's what we're, what we're facing now. And um, Chernobyl was completely shut down to the atmosphere within 15 days or 12 something. or 15 days something mm -hmm. like that they, yeah, they managed to cover it mm -hmm. of course so, all almost all those people that did that heroic work died of acute radiation sickness shortly after I mean right it was a you know I mean wow I mean I don't know if they knew they were given their lives or if they had no choice or what a combination of those things but yeah it was capped and so the the radiation stopped well Japan probably won't send their people in to do that until who knows when so it's possible this thing could keep spouting radiation for a long time I, I, who knows who knows what's going to happen with it um, the radiation didn't also it so much depends upon the wind and it may be that different products different radionuclides are put off at different times I know the it seemed like the biggest batch of cesium and strontium went off in the first few days after the explosion and those clouds carried up into Lapland where um, Finland Sweden and the Arctic where the reindeer were really seriously dosed um, people say, well, if the radioactive iodine affected the breeding birds in California, why didn't it affect the breeding birds in Lapland, in Sweden, and Finland? And the answer is simple, that the birds were in the nest on May 6th, the baby birds, and the birds, baby birds that are in the nest up there are late July or early August, so that by that time the radioactive iodine had dropped down to to almost background levels again, and so the effect actually might not have been as great on baby birds up there as it was was here and now what the effect was on adult birds or anything like that by cesium or strontium or something maybe you know certainly reindeer were were, were affected much much greater in um, Lapland than deer were in California or anything like that so different animals different times in their life cycle or differentially subjective to effects of radiation and yeah we don't know we don't know a lot about it and 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 there has been well this book deadly deceit calls it a high level cover up um you know i don't know the details of that but it is they do show data in here to show that the vital statistics 
um, were changed dramatically after every one of the nuclear accidents, whether the Savannah River stuff in 1971 or Three Mile Island in 79 or Chernobyl in 86, um, that, that the statistics of births and deaths, infant mortality and so on got changed. And they always get revised. They get revised even up to a year afterwards when they are revised as to the point of residency rather than the point of death. And if a person dies in a plane crash in, in North Carolina but lives in California, th that gets revised as to these kinds of deaths and stuff. But the revisions are always really small and they're statistically, generally statistically insignificant. That is, this month is this revised up and the next month revised down so that when you look over a long period of time the revisions kind of you know are, are go to zero it, it, late birth certificates etc but it's really interesting after each of the each of the of the major releases of radiation there were 45,000 new births recorded in the in after the four months after Chernobyl in California in the the published data than in the original data <laughs> you know I mean like <laughs> wait a minute what kind of a, and, and when they when you ask them they say oh yeah well, there was a big computer failure or we changed the methods of doing this stuff and I, 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 I you know I can't I'm not I can't I can just look at the data and I can't accuse anybody of anything, but all you have to do is listen to the news and you see what people are saying in terms of, oh, there's nothing can go wrong, it can't happen here, there's nothing to worry about, you don't even have to wash the vegetables or any of that kind of stuff. And the corporate media and and mostly that, I guess, and and, and People that will make money off of nuclear plants and everything are, of course, going to be making it seem like it's nothing to worry about, downplaying it a lot. And that kind of dishonesty is 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 criminal because it people are going to suffer and die from it. I, I personally think from what I hear is that it's going to get worse over there and that there's going to be, if there isn't already, pretty good releases, of pretty large releases of radiation. And if there are releases of radiation, it's definitely going to get here because that's the way the wind blows, that's the way the earth turns. Um, the, and, um, and it's going to have an effect. It basically, you know, they talk about radiation not having much effect above background levels. Well, the fact of the matter is background levels have an effect and we've been facing humans and all other animals have been evolving that that's one of the problems you face in the environment is background levels of radiation and so as soon as you raise it above background levels at all you've increased the problem a little bit so there will be deleterious results of, to animals humans regardless that's going to happen because we've simply raised the, the, the radiation amount how much it is it depends on so many things on wind direction, when it gets here, whether it's coincident with rain, all kinds of factors like that. And um, yes, you know, Bob Dylan said it all, hard rains are going to fall, you know, and um, stay out of the rain. <laughs> what else can I say? Um, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, um, We'll see what happens. At least if there is some some major reproductive failure, we're going to pick it up at some 400 map stations across the country and, and maybe be able to correlate it with iodine and milk if they still measure it or, or whatever, you know, who knows. Good luck. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Good luck. <laughs>